So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into Mary's special Christmas card. Mary's special Christmas card. What a wonderful Christmas card this was. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual living. You can't live it, can't learn it. And carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins or sins of the tongue or revert sins. They should be confessed according to 1 John 1, 9 among one many scriptures, one that we use around here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, which restores us from carnality to spirituality in the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is absolute essential for Bible study, John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit will teach and recall. That's, that's a learning and living concept. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet to study with us as we introduce our Christmas story, especially what's going to be to transpire on Wednesday. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would certainly bring people to this wonderful study that will be on Wednesday for a lunch and a Christmas luncheon with doctrinal studies people. I pray the Holy Spirit would introduce it today in such a way that it would intrigue us and cause us to be uh, ambassadors for Christ or a priest that would encourage other people who may have difficulty driving at night, as we have noticed, to find a, a, a morning study with like minds people uh, and a great opportunity to invite business people and such as that to come for lunch. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess you probably realize the Christmas cards are probably the well, we know, we know that Christmas cards are the highest selling cards that people purchase. It, consistently, year after year, uh, they've been in the two billion number or greater. Two billion Christmas cards. So you can see that Christmas cards are a great contact from people to people, aren't they? I mean, there's people that you probably haven't talked to or maybe talked to but haven't been with in years. They receive a Christmas card, don't they? I try to do that. I try to keep a link with people that I would like to see come to Christ over my years, kids I went to high school with, uh, people I've known over the years with the different organizations that I've been privileged to be a part of in the Christian faith. Um, People that I know that are going through tough times, I send a Christmas card with a little special note in it, as I'm sure you do. I spent a, a lot of money. I'm part of that two million people. I spent a lot of money at Christmas cards, and boy, they're not cheap. I loved Sylvia Dennis. She always made her own. If you got a Christmas card that was bought out of a store, <coughs> You must have been down low on the line because she made them, and they were all personalized, and I loved getting her cards. She sent me cards on just about every occasion, even getting up in the morning. <laughs> she was wonderful, but and her cards always were such a wonderful expression of her relationship with you. And so I don't make cards, but I do write little notes in it because of that impact upon my life over the years from not only her, but other people to do that. So what's interesting to me, and I hope you can grab my imagination today, because I feel like God sent Mary a Christmas card and had it personally delivered by Gabriel, the archangel of the Messiah, uh, to, hand, to personally hand deliver it and make sure she understood exactly what it was saying. And so I envisioned a Christmas card and I envisioned it to go like this on your paper. On the front of the card, on the front of the card, it might have read something like this with a big Christmas tree with blue ribbons on it. You know, the first child that comes into a family, they always give a funny, they always give you funny ideas. They never tell you what, even if they know, they won't tell you whether it's a boy or girl. And then they surprise you with it in some funny way. Does your people do that, or are they just like, let's get over with it? Well, 
I'm a, I'm a kind of a guy who always liked the kind of mystery behind it, and I always liked the different ways that people uh, identify uh, to the family whether the child that they're carrying is a male or a female. I always kind of liked that. So I imagined that on the front of this card was a Christmas tree with blue ribbons on it. And underneath it said the words, congratulations. Then when it opened, on the, le on the left side of the card, do you always read the left side of the card? I always do. I always look to see who it's from, and then I go read it. Right? <laughs> well, anyhow, on the left side of the card, I, w I think this would be there, hail or greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you, and then underneath that would have been written, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, that's the big punch to me. The most important part of this, this Christmas card is that God has referred her to her as his favored one. Now, God don't say that many times in the Bible, so you ought to pay attention to it because it is in his heart. It is in his heart. See, I think sometimes people look at their life, either present or past, and they can't imagine that they could ever be favored of God. But that's not true. And Mary was kind of shocked with that salutation, favored one with God. She went, ooh, I don't know about that. So I think, I think on the left side of the card would be that, and then that would be identified. On the right side of the card, I think, is why Gabriel came. The first is a salutation. I think on the right side of the card, it might be written, Behold, you will conceive in your womb to bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. Whoa, that takes a breath out of you. Hmm? It did her. And then I think on the back side of this card might be written the, what this son would do prophetically. On the back side of the card, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end, Mary. That locked her into the great history that she would be the mother of the apex of human history. She would be the mother of the birth of the messianic savior of the world. That is a lot to digest in a card, isn't it? That's a whole lot of information. So what I want to do with this lesson today is I want to look at three aspects of this special Christmas card delivered by Gabriel, the archangel of the Messiah, from God to Mary. Here's the first thing that I found to be of interest. God's salutation to Mary reveals a special relationship between God and Mary from God's side. From God's side. See, no, normally we talk to God from the man's side to God. Oh, God, I'm so thankful that you're omnipotent. Oh, God, I thank you're omniscient. Oh, God, I th thank you that you're eternal life. Oh, God, I thank that you're the author of grace. Oh, God, I thank you this. And that's, and that's good. I think sometimes we don't reflect on what God says about us in a positive way. Because this message to her is all positive. Hail, hail, O favored one of God. And I find that to be of great interest, that God talks about his relationship to Mary from his side first and tells her why he handpicked her of all the girls in the tribe of Judah from the house of David, why she was picked. And I that, think that's a wonderful idea. And so I found that to be of interest to me. God's salutation to Mary, the believers, reveals a special relationship from God's side to Mary. Greetings, Cairo. You know, th that's a really interesting word because <clears throat> that's a present active imperative. <clears throat> that's a command <clears throat> of a greeting. <clears throat> I came... And, and the idea behind this word is joy. 
Kara. The idea behind it is joyful. I bring you greetings. I bring you good news. I, I, I bring you joy to the world. Joy to the world. That's all in that greetings or hail favored one. All of that is in that idea. Joy to the world. I bring you a message of good news. I bring you a message of great joy to the world, Mary. What a wonderful introduction to this card for Mary's life. And then he calls her favored one. This is an interesting word because this is where you get the word charis, the word grace. You can see it in there, C-H-A-R-I. You put an S on it, you got grace. This is a verbal form of it. Favored one. This is one. This is the object of God's great grace. Now, the reason the word favor is used, it's an Old Testament word. You're going to find the word favor in the Old Testament to describe grace. <clears throat> they called it favor. The New Testament, New Covenant, calls it grace. Doesn't call it favor. Calls it grace. You're going to find it. And the further we get into the new covenant, the more that word is transferred out of favor and into grace. Because it does mean grace. It's a different view prior to Christ's coming and after Christ's coming. Same word, viewed differently. And so this word grace or favor, favored one, favored one. Notice also it's a perfect passive participle vocative, that's that V, vocative singular feminine. And so favored one, along with the word hail or greeting, is the vocative. They're both important words of salutation to her, to her. This is a message from God delivered by Gabriel to a young woman of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David, who is engaged to a man called Joseph. It's a perfect passive participle. I'll come back to that in a moment. The Lord is with you. So he, he gives him two very important statements of introduction. Hail, or greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, We know the Lord is with her. Hebrews 13, 5. The Lord is always with you. He never leaves you nor forsake you. Agreed? That's an Old Testament concept, by the way, as well as a New Testament concept. So why did he say the Lord is with you? Right? The Lord is with you. Why did he say that? Because we know and she knows the Lord is with her. She understood like you do, the Lord never leaves you nor forsakes you. She understood that just as clearly as you do. So why did he say the Lord be with you? Because her mission in life is going to require that she knows the Lord is always with her. Because what he's about to drop on her and she says, may your bond slave do according... Be it done unto me, your bond slave, according to your will. Boy, listen, people. This word of God that's going to be given to her on that Christmas card is going to bring such changes in her life that she must never question that the Lord is with her in what he has, what information he's given to her about conceiving the Son of God. And listen, it's not going to be it's not going to be long when she's going to get the test of her life. Agreed. I mean, this is this is uh, going to be. And and listen, here's the point, Mary. I am with you. I've put this on you. According you said, according to your will, and boy, is that ever true. And it's going to come down at crunch times. Things are going to be so disrupted in your life because of my will. You must not keep your eyes attached to anything but faith. 
Not, don't, don't get involved in sight, Mary. The circumstances don't dictate who you are with me. The, what you see is not necessarily what's going to be. But I'll tell you, Mary, what is going to be is my will. You must never take your eyes off from my will. My will for you is dominant. My will for you trumps everything. And so he says, Mary, the message I'm about to give you is joy to the world. Greetings. You are favored by God for what I'm about to tell you. You've been handpicked and selected by God Almighty himself. And what this message is going to do, it's going to forever change your life. You know, that's what the word of God does, don't you? Forever changes your life. It has mine. It has forever changed my life. And when those changes begin to erupt in your life patterns and shift your life all out of different orders, you need to know that the Lord is with you because it is, your, it is his will that you serve, not your own. What a wonderful salutation this is. What a wonderful salutation this is when he said, Greetings or hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. What we have here is God to Mary revealing God's attitude about Mary's relationship with him. I mean, how many times did God, you know, he confirms his relationship with you as you get, begin to work his plan, his will out of your life, and you begin to see God is faithful to his will. As you do according to his will, he does according to your response to his will. And you go like, wow, this is really, God is really, God really does answer prayer. Oh, God really is ahead of my, my going and coming. Oh, God really is awesome, right? Now watch this. This word, favored one, it's a perfect passive participle. The vocative, the vocative singular feminine reveals a special bonding relationship between God and Mary from God's side. I, I, I tell you, you probably don't realize how much God really cares about you believing that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe that, you have probably no idea how much God enjoys having a relationship with you. What is in the heart of God regarding that relationship? There are two ways that God favors you. One is in Christ. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become the favored one in Christ. All the things that Christ is, you become. He's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's a priest, you're a priest. Eternal life. The whole situation, you know the 20 status privilege. <laughs> in the 50 things. And if you're new on the internet, you go to our website and you can find them. 50 things. See, in Christ you're favored, positionally. That's not what he said to Mary. What he said to Mary, you've become favored by me by your spiritual growth maturity. That's evocative of address. He calls her favored, not in Christ, where, where, where she is. But listen, but because of her obedience to the will of God, because of her consistent attitude, about walking by faith and not by sight. This vocative of address is how God addresses her in her Christian faith, not in her position in Christ. Vocative, it's part of the address. Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. The perfect tense is really interesting because the perfect tense means something completed in the past with the results, it remains completed in the present and the future. 
is sense of completion. Something is completion. Something has been reached to completion in Mary. And so let's remind ourselves what that was. Favored one. Here's what he said. You know, Mary, when you got saved, you were favored in Christ. Everything that he has to offer you, you receive by grace through faith and not of yourself. It was a gift of God. And Mary, I'm thrilled to death that that happened. But Mary, here's what I'm thrilled about. You took that information, that relationship that you have with me, with God, with Christ, through Christ. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You took that relationship of salvation in Christ with me where I became your dad. And listen, you've become a full-grown, spiritual, mature woman that I am pleased to say is favored by me. Not favored in Christ. Favored by me in her life, her existence on the earth. Mary, you have become favored by me by your life on earth for me. We all have that standing in Christ. That's not what he's talking about here. He's calling her to an assignment based on her faith relationship with him where he is favored. She's favored by him. Listen, here it is. Here it is. Hebrews 11.6. Write it down. Hebrews 11.6. You know what God is pleased by? In your life, you know what he's pleased by? Your faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Agreed? Yeah. But listen, what does please him and favor is your walk of faith. Do you see that? The desire in your heart to please God. The desire, the high motivation of your soul just to please God. Not to please myself, not to please others, but to please your relationship with God. As he unfolds the directive will of God in your life, you're just pleased no matter what the struggle, no matter how difficult it might be, no matter what kind of cost it might bring you, you find the gain, not the loss. You find the gain. Your focus is not on the loss. Your focus is on the gain. The gain I find in Christ in my relationship with God. What a wonderful thing this is, people. Yes, you have found favor with God in Christ, but in life, in life, your walk by faith, the desire to please God as he reveals his will to you, the desire to please him, knowing that no, no matter how the difficulty is, the directive will of God always has, always is underwritten by the Lord is with you. Always underwrote. He underwrites every will of God for your life. He underwrites it. The Lord is with you. Even if everybody else forsakes you, I will never, I will never forsake you doing the will. Isn't that wonderful? How important is the will of God in your life this morning? How important is it? How important is it this morning? You see? And how important will it be when the importance that you feel in your heart this morning gets to be challenged in your life? And people go like, you're not going to do that. You don't believe that. They, what are you doing for that? What's, what's going on? You, you hang in there. You walk by faith and not by sight. You're not walking to please others. You're walking to please God. Are you there? Huh? Well, when you get there, you get a letter from heaven. And it'll forever change your life. The will of God will drop into your soul and you'll go like, my life has been changed forever. There's no looking back. There's no looking back. The perfect tense shows a spiritual commitment of a relationship. The passive voice, the passive voice reveals Mary's spiritual development in her relationship with God. The passive voice. You have found favor with the Lord. You have found favor 
and the participle the participle reveals her spiritual maturity in her walk with the Lord. She has grown from being a baby believer to an immature believer to a mature believer, and she's not looking back. To, she's not looking back. She doesn't want to go back to any one of those stages in her life, and she's not going to. She has made up her mind where she's, where she's at and where she's going, and she's not looking back. Are you there this morning? Can any wind of doctrine blow you off course? Can any desire of your flesh blow you off course? If it can, you're not there. If it can blow you off course, you're not there. Three times, God has declared Mary is favored by him. He did it in the greeting Hail or greetings, the salutation. He did it with the words favored one, and he did it in verse 30 when he said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found, listen, you're missing it because you've been distracted by the word favor. Listen what he said. You have found grace with God. You, he's not talking about finding the doctrine of grace. He's talking about finding the experiential reality of grace is sufficient at all times, all places, all people, and all events of life. My grace is sufficient, perfected in weakness. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Are you there this morning? If you are, you'll get a letter from the heaven. It will be an assignment that will change your life forever. Change it forever. Change it forever. Point number two. Favored one. Favored one are the words God used to declare his view of Mary in her spiritual maturity. And why he selected her to be the mother of the son of God. You can read about it in verses 28 through 30. He used favored one as a, as a status term, given as a grace gift. Favored one is a grace gift. Without her previous knowledge or merit, she has received this status term. Favored one. Favored one. Listen, you want a little study? Look up how many times God put that title on anybody. Look up and see how many times he put that title on anybody. Don't, don't, don't. Spend a little time on that. Don't just skim over that idea, favored one. It is a term declaring made Mary's grace orientation to the plan of God in her life. Favored one. She wasn't chosen because she was a virgin. That was only a part of it. I might add a small part. A, a doctrinal part, for sure, uh, prophetically. No, that's not what God said. He didn't say, I chose you because you've kept yourself pure. That's not, even though that was true, that's not why he called her favored one. He called her favored one because of her maturity to walk the walk with God. The spiritual maturity to not let the things that cross her path distract her from where she's going. Don't let the things that cross your path on the way to fulfill the will of God in your life distract you from where he has called you to go. Favored one. You can see it in her response to God's salutation and what he asked her to do. She said, be it done to me according to your wor word. It shouldn't be world, but according to your word. According to your will. You know, sometimes, 
our past or things going in our present cloud our judgment on what God says about us? I think about, in the Christmas story, I think about a woman called Rahab, a prostitute before she was saved. Not after. Well, I say not after. At some point in her life, she chose to follow God because she believed the Lord was with her. And that was greater than anybody else had ever been with her. And she chose him over all the other choices in life. And God, listen, God recognized her. God put her in in the messianic genealogy of Matthew. There's not a legalist in the world all got together and voted would have put her in there. Nobody would have put her there. But God's grace, uh, and she become one of the favored ones. And, and what about Ruth? A Gentile. What do these women have in common with Mary? Spiritual growth, maturity. At some point, God favored them because of their walk to please him. Not themselves and not others. Where are you? Where are you today? When Mary heard this salutation, it shocked her. They shocked her. She never thought of herself in this way. How did she view herself? Listen to me how she viewed herself. A bond slave. That's a good view. You know how God viewed her? Favored one. <laughs> There's a big gap there. But she didn't see her a bond slave to her flesh. She saw her a bond slave to the will of God. Be it done to me according to your will or your word. That's how she viewed herself. A bond slave to the word of God. A bond slave to the will of God. Not to her flesh, not to the world, not to other people, not to circumstance of life. Where are you this morning? Where are you? Listen, here's, here's how some people view their life in Christian faith. I was talking to a guy the other day. When he got through, I said, are you telling me, and this is what I asked him, are you telling me, that if you stubbed your toe, God would cut your head off. Because he believed. He said he believed that he could commit a sin that would take him away from the work of Christ on the cross. I said, well, what would that be? And he said, well, I would be doomed. I, where, where would you be doomed to? I'm, I wanted to say it. And I finally got it out of him. He didn't like giving me that information, but he believed it. Why not state it? Quit giving me clouded terms that let's just get down, knit and grit. And then I told him, I said, let me tell you something about God's grace, buddy. When you stumble, your, when you stub your big toe, he doesn't cut off your toe nor your head. Think about that. Because God's grace is greater than your sin. You need to work, read the book of Romans. His, his grace is greater than sin. That's why he put his son on the cross. What a terrible attitude to have towards God. That if you, if you stub your toe, he cuts your toe or your head off. None of that's true. It's from a pit of hell. It just disturbs me so bad because it's such an attack upon God's grace. And people get that foolishness in their head, and it's hard to pull them out of it. 
even when I said, Does it, who would do that if you stubbed your toe? And God will certainly not do that. You don't understand grace. You don't understand grace. Well, this wonderful response from Mary reflects her intimate relationship with the Lord to please Him in all things. And it shows that the Lord is in a place of priority in her life, no matter what the circumstances. Listen, if God is not all, He's nothing. Do you know that? He's either all or nothing. Th that's grace. It's all God and not you. Where is God in your life? Where is God in your walk? Every day when you're walking to and fro among the, in the world like Satan is, where is your relationship with God reflected? You know, two people walking to and fro in the world, Satan and you and me. The difference is he attacks the whole program of God, and we're supposed to support it. Mary is one of those women who supported, God bless her, one of those. And I'm going to tell you, it's about where Christ is in the priority of your life. Where is he in the priority of your life? Where is he? Is he in the place of priority of your life, no matter what the circumstance? In your relationship, is he priority? Mary had reached a place in her spiritual growth where she walked by faith and not by sight, no matter what the circumstances, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This is where she lived consistently by the victorious faith life of 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It didn't say whoever. It says Whatever. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, faith, our faith. Mary was such a person that had that walk, and that's why God called her favored one. Finally, Mary is an example of the importance of reaching spiritual maturity and maintaining it unto dying grace. Second, write this down. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Listen, unless the rapture comes, we're all going to go there. And listen, you need to be mature when the mature time comes. You need to be mature now. How are you dealing with difficult situations and circumstances in your life now? Because it'll have a lot to say how you do it then. Learn it now. Learn it now. I love 1 Corinthians 15.10 because I love grace. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. Listen, you ought to write that somewhere in the bathroom. You know, somewhere where you're on a regular base and quiet. Don't put it in TV room. Don't put it in the kitchen. Put it someplace where you have to get quiet for a moment. Don't put it in your bedroom because you sleep. Put it someplace. Maybe put it in your car where you can see it once in a while. Put it someplace where you can get quiet. I don't know if the car would be good <laughs> in the traffic. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am who I am. That's what he's saying, Mary, with favored one. That's Mary's motto. By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's her motto of life. It was Paul's motto of life. He would like that to be your motto of life so God could look upon you as a favored one and he could begin give you assignments that are out of this world assignments. When you get into super grace maturity and show God that you are willing to be obedient and you can stay the course, 
He will show you things and involve your life in things you could have never, ever imagined. I want that so bad for your life. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Well, you ought to circle that. Because that's what grace is all about. When you get grace where God views you as the favored one, he's going to put your life in such situations that the effect of God's grace in your life is going to be so overwhelming evidence to other people. You treat them in grace. When they should be treated every other way, you treat them in grace. You want to really see a great picture of that? Look at Joseph and the way he treated his family after they treated him. Go back and take a look at our Tuesday night Bible study. It will surely arm you up with that. No, I work harder than others, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. See, Paul's saying, I worked hard, but I didn't work for merit or wages. I did it to please God. See, he said, I worked hard. Then he went, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't misunderstand what I just said. Don't misunderstand that. I worked hard to please God. I didn't work hard for merit. I didn't work hard for wages. I worked hard to please God. Yeah. As a spiritual mature believer, Mary was tested in three areas. Are you teachable in verse 29? Are you testable in verse 34? And are you trustworthy in 38? And let me tell you, you're not going to get it without some testing. So you've got to be teachable, you've got to be testable, and, you, and you've got to be trustworthy. She's ready for an assignment. An assignment is given to her. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah. In spiritual mature believers, all relationships are secondary to the Lord. Even in marriage. In marriage, you know the chain of command in marriage? You better. You know the chain of command in marriage? The Lord, the husband, the wife. Did you hear that? The Lord, the husband, and the wife. When a wife has a problem with the husband, where does she go? She goes, the Lord. She goes up the chain of command. I always say, girls, that's when you need to up his life insurance and, and make sure he's got good medical. Yep. Do you know what? And I got to close. Doing God's will is not risky for Mary. That's why she's the favored one. She's, she's grown out that idea. She's grown above that idea. This is not risky for her at all. Is it risky? Yeah, but not to her. Why? Lord is with me. His grace is sufficient. How do you know that, Mary? Because it always has been. This is nothing new to me, Ron. This is the way I live my life. This is the way I live my life. She is God's first choice because God is her first choice in all the relationships. She is God's first choice because God is her first choice in all of her relationships. Are you there this morning? Are you there? You ought to be. Why aren't you there? These are choices. These are choices. Ephesians, that should be Ephesians 4, by the way, not 3. That should be Ephesians 4, 13 through 15. That's a typographical problem. Listen, Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord with what? You shall love the Lord your God with what? Yeah. Ah. And, and you shall love the Lord with all your soul. How much? Huh? How much? And, and with all of your mind. How much? How much? Yeah. Now you know you've come. When, you got the, when you're there on a consistent day-to-day -day basis, you know you're there. You have now reached 
the status of favored one. Not once in a while. Well, I used to be that way, but I, no, 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 no. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, all of the time. Oh, you go like that's impossible. No, it's not. You have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And what should be your motto? I live to please God, not to please myself. I don't live to please myself nor other people. I live to please God. You say, Ron, that's impossible. I'm married. <laughs> it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. Of course. Well, <laughs> you don't know. If you had the job I have, I know. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Difficult don't mean impossible. Difficult means you're alive. You could live in a closet. Have food ordered. They'll now deliver it to you. So you could live in a closet the rest of your life. That's no ministry. How do you know if your relationship with the Lord is primary or secondary? What distracts you from it is the answer. What distracts you from it? You must develop a bond slave mentality to your relationship with the Lord over all other relationships. She says to him, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done, done to me according to your word or will. Paul called it, and I love this, he called it undistracted devotion to the Lord. Oh, if I could get you to do that, if I could get to do that, wouldn't we be something? Undistracted devotion to the Lord. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Then I'll take the offering. Father, we're so thankful. Was Mary some kind of super duper gal? Nah. Did she become one? Yeah. Was she one? Nah. Got saved like the rest of us. Had to grow and mature like the rest of us through trial and errors and difficulties. Come to a place in her life where you're the most supreme thing in her life. Can we reach that, Father? Of course we can. Do we have a desire? I hope so, Father. I've delivered my Christmas card. I hope so. It is my desire to teach it for that purpose, to encourage our people to reach it, maintain it, so that they can become the favored one of God and he can begin to show them things of the plan of God that are so magnificent and so far out there Oh, Father, to be a part of that kind of movement of God in the world is such a joy. I pray for that today for our congregation that have come by automobile and by the Internet. In Jesus' name, amen.